Dave up here at the Root House. Uh, the microphone is not quite working, so I hope that everyone can hear me. I was going to use the microphone, but you know, since it's not working, I thought I'd kind of come stand right here in the middle, and then everybody can possibly hear me. So, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I, I thought I'd take care of a few housekeeping uh, issues very quickly. Uh, because we have some very, very important people uh, that are in a room with us. And I always like to acknowledge our elected officials. Uh, because I, I always like to, you know, show folks that, you know, look, we support each other. Uh, I want you to know who's in the room. So and you may have a question for them, and they're ready for your question also. So we have our wonderful mayor, Mayor Brenda Lawrence, here joining us. Hi. Hello. We also have our city councilman, uh, Myra Frazier, here. And uh, Jeremy, here you go. I was looking for him. Jeremy Moss, our city councilman, Jeremy Moss. One of our, one of our new guys here. So, uh, so uh, City of Southfield, all, all from City of Southfield. I don't think I see anyone here from uh, any other community. Greg uh, Melvin's well, here. Greg Melvin's here. He's on the planning commission. Planning commission. I'm sorry, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> bring an important issue uh, back to the community. Uh, transportation is going to be a, a very high issue uh, coming up very, very soon uh, in Lansing. Our governor gave a special message on transportation. The governor's been doing a series of special messages, uh, things that uh, he's been kind of you know, setting a platform for and you know, maybe setting some policy direction on. And these are his priorities. Uh, so transportation became one. And so we're, we probably won't take transportation up right this second, but it is coming up very, very soon, and it's going to be a very hot issue. So what I thought I'll do, you know, being, being the smart elected official that I am, <laughs> is to come home and talk to, you know, our constituents about, and our residents about transportation issues and kind of explain what's going on in Lansing and get feedback. Uh, because, look, you know, the last thing I would want to do is get a lot of emails from all of you saying, Rudy, you know, what in the world are you doing and how are you voting? But I wanted to definitely hear what you had to say. Uh, again, it's going to be very important. And a lot of things that uh, I'm sure all of you know about our roads. I mean, you know, our, our roads in Michigan, I mean, they are just, you know, they're in bad, bad shape. I had my grandmother visiting from Alabama this, this week. And uh, so my auntie, they both from Montgomery, Alabama, they came up to visit. So uh, my grandmother has a brother that lives in Cleveland. So she said, Rudy, you know, you have to go take me to see my brother. So, you know, we, you know, we get grandma all together, you know, get in the car. And so my auntie kept saying, are we in Ohio yet? You know, you're kind of going down 75. Are we in Ohio yet? I'm like, auntie, trust me. You can close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and Soon as you hit Ohio, you will know because the roads will stop talking to you. Mm -hmm. All right. So as soon as we got into Ohio, she bust out laughing because she saw exactly what I mean. I mean, you're going down 75 and you're passing, you know, that last exit and you're heading off. And as soon as you get into Ohio, the roads become that much quieter. All right. And so we know that our roads need lots of improvement. We need lots of attention. And so and, and what some of the things that the governor laid out and uh, and some folks who know this stuff much, much uh, more detail than I do uh, will kind of go through it. Uh, but one of the things that the governor laid out was uh, an increase in revenue. And we all know what increase in revenue means in this room. That means an increase in tax, right? And so uh, we'll talk about those things and we'll go through them. Uh, there was a guy that was going to join me. His name is Jim Shea. Jim Shea is uh, an awesome advocate uh, for our state's infrastructure. I mean, he, he has he owns a company that puts the stripes on a line in the freeway. It sounds so simple, but you know, Jim Shea is his company is the one that actually uh, that, that does that. And so he he cornered me uh, one day, you know, in my office, of course, and and said, Hey, Rudy, look. Here's the issue. 
you know, and he was so passionate about talking about these roads and, you know, our region's future and how our infrastructure, you know, is a big part of our future. And he got me really, he got me really interested in the whole idea of transportation. And he had this contest called, um, it actually has a nonprofit, uh, Students Reinventing Michigan. And what he does is he presents a problem to high school students uh, across the state. And the last, the last uh, contest was how do you know how do we improve the state's uh, infrastructure? Uh, you know how, how do we come up with solutions for that? The first place, the first place one gets like ten thousand dollars. Okay, so Jim Shea is you know he, he writes a nice check to the students who actually wins. And so uh, you know he has been taking this from community to community and talking about it. he couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, but I believe Dennis is going to uh, help us out with his presentation tonight. And so, uh, how about how about I share this? Dennis is going to give a presentation. You can ask questions as we go. Uh, we will acknowledge you, and we will give you the best answer and the most honest answer that we can possibly give you. Uh, so tonight, we're joined by Dennis, uh, Troy from NDOT, and then we have Kurt also from NDOT. And we have Lori from MDOT. So you see we have the Michigan uh, Department of Transportation here uh, in full effect. Yes, ma'am. I'm Linda Shea. And uh, I just came to Jim and I have this information. Is, this is Jim's <laughs> wife. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim is very upset he couldn't be here. I'm it, sure. It, yeah. I'm sure. He was. So you have something to pass Do you want to say anything? Well, okay. What this is is... Um, material that you know, this panel will be talking about that Jim put together and on um, the front is about this year's competition. We started this competition last year. We're hoping to keep it going. Um, we're looking for some donors and for some help with it, but we've been funding it all ourselves. This year it's on education. So if you know any college students or high school students um, who would like to take part in this competition, it would be great. Last year, a young man from Michigan State won $10,000 and a young lady from Central Michigan won $5,000. And their mentors, or people who helped them put their proposal together, they won some money also. And basically what it is, is it's getting young people involved in the legislature and seeing what they think would be a good idea to help the state of Michigan. So this year it's on um, making sure that high school students are prepared to go to college. Research has found that 17, only 17% 17 of high school students who plan to go to college are really prepared. And so they go to college and they have to pay all this money for courses which they should have gotten that information in high school and they shouldn't have to be paying for it now. So we really feel that our young people have a lot of good ideas and so we are really encouraging them to take part in what's going on. Jim and I travel a lot out of the country and the more we travel the more we realize that America is a great country and so we are trying to do our part. So what I'd like to do is just pass this around. A lot of it is what this panel is going to be talking about, but on the front is about this year's competition and the website where, you know, if you know any students, have them look at it and encourage them to participate. Um, last year we didn't have that many proposals, so the chances are pretty good that they could win some money. We've got a first, second, and a third, and a fourth place this year. Okay? And with that, I'm just going to pass it out. And okay. It's all up to you. Linda, could you kind of mention also what the winning proposals were for transportation this um, year and, and how, what their ideas were? Okay, and part of that is going to be covered oh, okay. in this. Okay? okay perfect. Um, in actuality, Jim didn't want me to read the proposals and I was starting to read them. Well, the, actually the committee from the House and the Senate, they are the ones who judge the proposal. So I started reading them and Jim said, no, 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 no. 
that's not our job. We have to let them do it, and you can't give any influence. So he stopped me from doing it. <laughs> You're welcome. Jason, I didn't, Linda, I didn't know you were going to be here. I'm doing Jim's presentation. So oh, you know, no, I'm, I'm glad you are. You're going to have to agree with me afterwards. Uh, my name is Dennis Kovar. I'm managing director of the Road Commission for Oakland County. I did bring some pamphlets up a little plug-in for us back on the back table, some things about roundabouts, flashing yellow lights, our guide to Michigan's funding crisis, a lot of it I'll be talking about with Jim's presentation. So I'll ask for a little patience. So the first time I'll be giving Jim's presentation, I got a, kind of got a late call today, so I got seen it and reviewed it. And a lot of the stuff for those of us that are in the transportation business, you know, we know a lot of this stuff, but it was refreshing that you took a group, some students, that knows nothing about transportation. And take a look at the problem, and this is what they found. Okay, they took a look at our transportation problems. What did they learn? They learned about our road crisis, and that a lot of us share the same misconceptions about transportation, and I'll go through some of those, which they found out, and I'm sure when I get there, some of you will say, yeah, that's what I thought. And many people have similar questions about roads and bridges. And this is a sharing of what they learned. Again, the beauty of this is this is students that had no idea about transportation. This is what I'll talk about, fact or fiction. That's, again, talking about some of the misconceptions. How Michigan compares to other states. Uh, Representative Hobbs talked about Ohio, and you'll see a chart here, there's a good explanation why Ohio roads are better than Michigan's roads. Some other facts, and then we'll wrap it up with a conclusion. I think we all agree transportation is something that's important to whether it's public safety, the economy, economy in Oakland County, if we have congestion, businesses are going to look elsewhere where they're not going to be congested, and overall quality of life. We have good transportation networks, streets, sidewalks, and even transit. That makes your community that much better. And then once you have that, you're going to have increased public safety, economic growth and development, and we'll be attracting new people and a new workforce. And actually in Oakland County, that's already starting to happen, but it's not a result of the road yet. Now we'll go through some misconceptions about transportation. Michigan roads are not as safe as they could be. Well, unfortunately, and being an engineer, I hate to say this, but our system, the way it is crumbling, it's probably not as safe as it used to be. I'm sure some of you have traveled the freeways and seen in some of these bridge decks where they're putting in some false work between the beams to protect the concrete from falling down. You can look at it. I'll use one of our examples at the Road Commission. I'm sure most of you have traveled 10 mile road in Southfield intersection. <laughs> I mean, we did we did some patchwork last year, and it's it's a lot better, but it's really not what it should be, and I'm sure you would all agree. Mm -hmm. Michigan roads are worse than any other state in the country. Well, almost. <laughs> And Overdrive magazine, this is where this ranking comes from, it's a trucking magazine. Well, who knows better than truckers? That Michigan's no, we're number two. I'm going to say, who do you think's number one? Alaska. No. It's not, it's not, it's part of the contiguous states. New York. New York is um, third. New York and California are tied for third. Pennsylvania's number one. And, you know, obviously we, we talk about it here in Michigan. Yes, we do have a harsh climate. You know, the way our weather fluctuates, the soil materials we have, that does wreak havoc. If you go to Wisconsin, they're not, they don't have the freeze thaw cycle. They're a lot colder than us. Michigan is almost its own microenvironment when it comes to weather. And then Census Bureau data, and this is one I use when I go around for the Road Commission, 
is for the last 50 years, Michigan's ranked near the bottom in per capita spending on transportation. That's just a fact. I and mean, you say, you, you're going to get what you pay for. Matter of fact, we've ranked over the past 50 years from bottom seven down. You know, we're bouncing around from 43 to 49. Well, there's a good reason why trans our road network and our bridge system looks the way it is. It's, we've chosen as a state or as our legislator to fund it at that level. If you look at us for health and education, we're in the top ten. So it's choices that we've made over the years that have gotten us in this problem we're at today. Heavy trucks are ruining Michigan's roads. Well, that's really fiction. We, we do have 164,000 pounds on 11 axles. Standards 80,000 pounds. I don't know if Jim has the other chart in here, and if you look, there are states that allow up to 190,000 pound trucks. And, and there's not a large number of these trucks, okay? Yeah, they're out there, and yes, I'm not going to deny they do some damage, but that's not the problem, okay? It is our overall lack of investment. I pay enough taxes for roads. Well, your taxes, of course, you know, we call it a gas tax. Those of us in the business really think it should be called a user fee when we talk about a gas tax. You know, if you talk about paying a toll, all right, you, you pay a toll and you drive a certain number of miles. You put gas in your car and you pay a tax, you drive a certain number of miles. Essentially, you've been paying a toll every time you fill up. You're just not stopping at a booth. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a problem with the gas tax. I'm sure if you see the latest is was raising the average fuel economy to 54 and a half. Well, that is going to be a decline in revenue. We're already seeing that. Our revenues are flat in transportation in Michigan and declining because vehicles get better fuel economy. Now, we're selling more vehicles, but they get a lot better fuel economy. So that, that is an issue. Some of the things that the students found, uh, there's uh, folks talking about the cable guardrails that MDOT's been putting up. We don't have any of those at the Rural Commission yet, but these are typically done on the interstates and the higher speed facilities. But they work. And of course, in this area, we don't see that. We have concrete barrier walls. But as you get out in the rural areas, they work and they save lives. And really, that's the number one thing for us in transportation is the safety of the motor vehicle. If we find sort of a system that saves lives, we're going to use it. Sidewalks and bike paths waste, waste money at the expense of roads. Yeah, there's, you can make that argument, but again, the, the amount of money that goes to those facilities is a small portion of the overall transportation fund. That's not the problem. I think in communities like Southfield, you want to see bike paths. I mean, that's what you want to see. When the roads widen, you want to see good facilities for pedestrian travel as well. Michigan roads are constantly under construction because contractors use such standard materials. Well, we all follow it's MDOT and the Federal Highway. There's spe specifications for materials that we all have to follow. Now, are there problems from time to time? I'm not going to stand up here and tell you there aren't. But the fact is the materials we use now are far better than we used 30 years ago when I started in this business. There's lots of research. It does nobody any good to place a product that doesn't perform. It really doesn't. And what they have here is Michigan, and I'm saying, thinking LDOT carries warranties on 80 to 90 percent of their preventative maintenance jobs. So there's a big conversation, well, what about warranties? And if the, if the project's active, if there are warranties, we'll tell the contractor, rip it up. We're not going to pay them. That happens probably more than we like sometimes, but yes, we do that. I work, highway workers stand around all day doing nothing. 
<laughs> Looks that way sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> and this one is, I, and I understand that. You know, if you're in the business, you understand what goes on. But if you're driving by, I've got to admit, I've driven by one. Who's anybody else? But there's reasons for that. If you're placing concrete, it takes a number of days to cure. There's lots of other activities that are going on, whether it's underground utilities, storm sewer, they might be in an isolated area of the whole project limits. But typically there's work going on. Um, sometimes they're waiting for materials to be delivered. Um, there's lots of reasons for it. And if you have a, you know, a long length of project, for instance, we're right now rebuilding Lasser Road, um, you have to keep that whole project down to one lane. You can't keep switch traffic every day. That doesn't work well. You want the motorists' expectations when they drive through a construction zone on a major project to be the same every day. Not switching up. It's difficult enough to navigate through some of these construction projects with the amount of traffic. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Like streets like uh, 10 Mile Road, how, um, I mean, when I first moved to Southfield, they were just putting in the new street out 10 miles. And then they um, they turned around maybe maybe 10 years, 10 years later and they were redoing the whole street again. How long should these streets, you know, last? I mean, you said that the streets last their better materials and things, but then yep. like to me, the Here, streets that's, that's the one i got to get to. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Well, I, like, I like your thinking. You're thinking in the right direction. Repave roads should last longer than they do. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what we do in the road industry, is, uh, it's called a mix of fixes, <coughs> is you have to look at the facility you have, and sometimes you're just going to resurface it because that's the best value for money at that point in time. I'll use an example like a roof on your house. If you catch a roof on your house, you can just shingle it. And it's a relatively, it's still expensive, but it's not as expensive if you let it go and then you have to replace boards, rafters, things like that. So we look at a mix of fixes. Sometimes if we can just put a resurface on it and get another seven years, let's just go deal with another project that may be like lots of road that needs a total rebuild. So you'll see that. Sometimes we do just a slurry seal. There's lots of different things we do, but our goal is to try to extend the life of the pavement because we can't replace everything at once. That answer some of it? I mean, because what I saw was, from what I saw, and I, I, I don't tend to be an expert, is that they redid the whole road. And then they came back and redid the whole, I mean, they were taking out the whole street. Again. So I couldn't understand. I said, well, how come they're redoing this whole street again? I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't understand that. Well, I do know on, the, on pieces of the model that I was involved in a long time ago is that we did leave two lanes in and we added three lanes of concrete to make it five lanes. We did leave some old and then we had to go back and repair some things. Mm -hmm. But that was our choice. And I don't know what section on 10 Mile Road here. 10 Mile is Southfield Road. No. That's the area I'm talking about. 10 Mile and Southfield? Ten, right at 10 Mile and Right Southfield. at the intersection. Straight, I mean, I'm not just saying 10 Mile and Southfield, but it was straight on down through, it looked like, I don't know if it went to, all the way to Telegraph or not. Well, 2009, we did 10 Mile Road to the east mm -hmm. uh, as a resurface, and that was stimulus money, but that was, again, that would be a mix of fix for us to resurface it and buy some time. <coughs> Okay, how does Michigan compare with other states? I mean, so Representative Watts was talking about giving an uh, example about Ohio. Let's see if I get this. Here's the gas taxes, and that's Kentucky, Minnesota, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, and Illinois. And you can see we're at 19 cents. Ohio is 28 cents. In this case, it's a, it's, a pretty it's a pretty simple reason why Ohio has a lot more money to do what they do. And they also, well, we all know they have a toll road that goes through it. And then toll roads that 
money that has to go to the toll road, but that leaves the money that may have went there to use on some other roads. Point out here in Michigan, <coughs> we're a little bit there. We put sales tax on our price of fuel. The sales tax, obviously, I think I have another slide there. Sales tax goes for other things that doesn't go for transportation. So overall, the, we're at 38 cents, but only 19 goes to transportation. And it's been 19 cents since 1997. <coughs> and a little side note, had, <coughs> this is no knock on you, Representative, had the last gas tax been indexed to inflation, it'd be 28 cents right now. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little bit confused on the gas tax and the sales and other taxes. You say only 19 cents goes towards our road yeah. uh, transportation system. Where does the other 19 cents go? Uh, there's, a, there's a slide coming up then. Okay. I'll, I'll show you a little okay. more. <coughs> uh, obviously it goes, it goes to schools and things like that. But, I mean, really, it, get, it gets back to you get what you pay for. Last time they asked for a gas tax, the state needed 10 cents and settled on 4 cents. That's correct. And Rudy, you weren't there at the time, but they <laughs> figured that's what they could get. And ever since then, we've been struggling with roads, we've been struggling with mass transportation. I've been playing around with mass transportation and roads for almost 17 years. And I still don't see the mass transportation. I see the bad roads, and I'm one of those that has to cross 10 miles of Southfield to get to the other side of the city. And the quick fix is not going to last as long as you think. We have these big trucks, and you can stand on that corner and watch them going flying by from one expressway to the other. And it's the question, is that road really going to last with those, all those trucks that go through there? I don't think so. I mean, I live there from two lanes on Southfield from two lanes on 10. I've been in that neighborhood 47 years. I'm not going to disagree with you. I tell you, we, we did the best we could with what we had last year, and that was better than it was, but it's certainly not well, the solution. Well, we appreciate that. that. <laughs> it's certainly not the solution. But I, I agree with that. Uh, it, the street itself really cannot take the traffic it gets. That's one of the busiest roads on, on my own. That is, that is one of the busiest intersections I have seen. Yep. That is true. 12 and Telegraph is the worst as far as that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so this shows you some of the taxes, the gas tax, some of the other sales taxes in the total. This shows the registration fees. <coughs> I'm sure they'll be able to talk about that as we look to new revenue, but if you look at registration fees now on an almost $20,000 car, you know, we're, we're right in the, the average, but the trucks aren't paying quite as much.
four cents a gallon to the highway trust fund, and the highway trust fund nationally is experiencing the same things, same thing. Michigan's transportation fund is. It's it's running running low on revenue. Question? Yes. The federal gas tax um, is that distributed back to the state on a per capita? They have they have their funding formula on per capita miles of roads, but good luck. I'm gonna <laughs> very complicated formulas. Yeah. In fact, we're a donor state, so every dollar that we send to, to Washington, we actually only get 95 cents back. Yeah. See that? Right, but you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, some states get over a get over a, a dollar. Yep. But there there has been a little bit of a change. There, have, there was a change. Yeah. But if if you take into account because the highway trust fund has actually run out of funding the past few years, and the federal government has had to take general fund money and put it in the highway trust fund to keep it solvent. So you could argue that. You know, no way to donor state anymore because they're putting general fund money in. But, right. exactly. but the formula still comes back as it was, right. and we don't receive as much as you could argue that we should. But that's a national problem. That I'm sure that will be coming up soon uh, because uh, nationally the infrastructure is falling apart as well. And for major projects, you know, us at the Road Commission, we rely on that for projects. We can't use any federal money for plowing snow, but we do rely on it for our projects. Make sure you talk to your federal, federal legislators about <laughs> that. <laughs> it's important. And this is looking a little closer at the state gas tax and 50% of it, and if you call everything a tax, 50% goes to transportation, and I believe it's 35% to schools, then there's some for local governments and some other. Don't you know, ask me what other means. I don't know. What? Mm -hmm. Flush. What? Flush fund. Flush fund. Okay, where do we go from here? Well, it's a cost of doing nothing. Let's say we, we're going to be happy with where we're at. I mean, the cruel reality is. There's not additional revenue coming in. So what does this mean? Every year that we delay investing in the infrastructure, it's going to fail more, and it's going to cost more. My example of the, the roof. We catch a roof when we don't have to do major repair work to the structure, our dollars go farther. If we wait until the whole thing's collapsing, it's going to cost us a heck of a lot more money. And here's an estimate that it could be as much as $22 billion. So, uh, we don't invest. And we count on our legislators to find some way to increase revenue for the transportation network. The system is going to continue to deteriorate. And this is, I believe this came from an organization called TRIP. They're a nonprofit organization out of um, Washington, D.C. And they say in Michigan typically it's $300 a year in additional vehicle repairs because of the condition of the road. And obviously if you travel some other rough roads, yours is going to cost more, but that's on average. And when we get into the gas tax and some of the, the raising the revenue, some of the figures I've heard has been an additional $115 per year to increase or <coughs> help the network out. That's certainly a bargain if you look at that. So that's the conclusion of Jim's presentation. Linda, did I do okay? You did just fine. The only thing that I know is in all the research that Jim did on getting the money back from the federal government. Um, and he really studied this. According to him, we are not a donor. And we are actually getting a dollar or two back on every dollar we Well, have. and that's one of what I was mentioning, and I'm sure Jim did that. Yeah. If you look at, because the Highway Trust Fund was insolvent, you had to take general fund money, no longer get federal gas tax money, and put it in that fund to complete the system. So at that point, yes, everybody's 
2013, correct me if I'm wrong, Representative, I know there was a one-time uh, diversion of general fund money to help make up that difference so that we could match that money that's in Washington waiting for us. Um, and what's really concerning is if we don't make that match, that money goes to other states. It doesn't just sit there and wait for us. So we got to make sure we make that match, and it's really important for us to do that. So that's that first slide. We use toll credits um, yep. this year as well, okay. um, which toll credits are kind of hard to explain, not being a finance expert, but they're really sort of like funny money. They're not, they're, they're credit, credits that we get from um, the Mackinac Bridge or any facility that's being tolled, uh, and then we use those to match, but it actually comes back at, at less dollars than we could if it was real money. Right. So. And then the next slide is just a representation of our paving conditions. Uh, Dennis touched on, you know, our roads, and everybody knows that I drive every day from that, and so I'm riding those roads every day, and it's hard on my car. I'm one of those hundred dollars a year, probably more. But as you can see, the, the trend is very concerning. You know, the good is going down and the bad is going up. So I'm um, just basically confirmed what we know and what we drive on every day um, out there. Is it half a train or a bus? Do you think you may have to camp Yeah, actually, I would. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And the next piece, and I think someone had touched on it, I think you touched on it, that you know, when we had our last gas tax increase in 1997 or 96, um, what was, it was, they needed 10 cents, right. and they ended up having 4 cents, and they never yeah. come back. Yeah. Right, so back in 97. And my unit, we worked on mass transportation through our temple for God knows how many years, I will say at least 17 
by I think it's 2022 that 33% of our pavements will be in good condition. So basically, we'll be driving pretty much on the ground. So, um, so that's what I wanted to touch on as far as where the funding comes from. We Dennis touched on you. Obviously, we've got a fixed. Uh, we call it a user fee, 19 cents. Uh, state tax, we've got 18 and 18.4 uh, cents. Uh, federal tax or user fee, and obviously, as, as this shows, it's really not really not cutting it for us uh, as far as transportation and keeping up with our condition needs and not only condition needs, but as you get to see on 696, um, 75 during rush hour, there's congestion too, and you know with that, this money is not even to address that. That'll just take care of our, you know, basically the conditions of the road. That's not adding new lanes or anything to help increase capacity so that people can move forward. You know, move through the, the, the areas freely, and not only the people, but also the goods that keep our economy going, too. So, yes? Do you have any updates on the federal transportation bill and the transportation enhancements? And any other updates on the state's big street program? The federal federal bill was, they, they got the reauthorization right before, it was around the 4th of July. Holiday, they came up with reauthorization. I'm surprised everybody. We got reauthorization as a two-year bill, um, which basically funded at pretty much the levels that we were funded at before. So under investing again, um, and it's a two-year bill. The complete streets. The state transportation commission, at their most recent meeting, uh, adopted a, as far as MDOT goes, adopted a complete streets policy. So we have one in place now. Um, and uh, it really ties into stuff that we've already been doing as far as context sensitive solutions, working with communities to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to all road users, not just motorists, but also to pedestrians, bicyclists, people that are, have disabilities, um, which I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of it around the, the area we're going in and taking up the sidewalks at the intersections to make sure that their handicap is accessible. Um, and actually that's a federal requirement, um, but you know, we're doing that everywhere in the state. Um, so, but as far as complete streets, we do have a policy in place. If you get on our website, mdot, uh, www.michigan.gov forward slash mdot, um, you know, if you type it in Google, complete streets uh, policy Michigan, it'll come up and it's about a two or three page document. So, and basically what it asks is, it, what it says in there is that it requires us to work with the locals um, to try and incorporate as much as we possibly can as far as uh, complete streets go. So, and that, again, takes into account all users of the roadway. Yep. It, it appears to me that the claim that the stimulus fund did no good is belied by this chart. Well, the, the stimulus funds actually helped. If we, if we didn't have the stimulus funds, we'd be in worse shape even today. Exactly. Right. They did help. They did help a lot. They helped take care of I know when, at the time I was up in Bay City, the Saginaw area, if anybody's driven up in that area, going up north on, for a holiday or going up to visit somebody up north, we had some really bad pavement up by kind of the Milwaukee Bridge north of there, and we were able to actually reconstruct and take care of that, and not just patch it like we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. Yes. In your opinion, who is opposing the adequate funding for federal roads? I have. I you are? No, not me. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. It's just uh, just a Lansing that won't. No, I. Why don't, why don't we do that to the sure. segue sure. into Detroit? Sure. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. Uh, mine was just the opposite of his. This, my question was, did you come here asking, showing us how we need to increase? Is, is that your, pur your purpose here? I think it's just to show what the needs are. Well, I guess one thing I want to point out, though, that I didn't bring up is that you guys are probably asking, well, what, are you guys, what have you done? to make yourselves more efficient. And actually what we've done as a department, MDOT at least, over the last year is we've cut 48, just over $48 million in costs. We closed eight facilities, we cut four, uh, 200, 400, excuse me, 450 jobs, so about 30% of our workforce we cut. Um, and we were making efficiencies left and right, just trying to save as much money as we can. So in the last year or so, we've really tightened our belts. We Again, we're down quite a bit of staff. Um, and we saved about $48 million, so. Yeah, we've well, got yeah, one, one other question well, just for you. Yep. Sir, I don't know if that'll be touched on by somebody else, but I've heard other people talking about public transportation. Yep. I'm really concerned, we also talked about the helping the disabled. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me it's more difficult to get passes now and to disability. Um, 
I tend to work in the field, and we have six medical buildings on the corner of Nine Mile and Wasser, and there's no bus stop within a mile yeah. of there. And it's becoming a burden on the smart system because mm -hmm. they cannot get our people to us. Um, I don't know how we can get a bus stop, and it's really critical there. Um, it just seems that it's more and more difficult to get people to and from I appointments. And it's like right. other medical offices that have nothing to do with my office, okay. as well as the Walgreens. There's no bus that goes down nine miles for about a two mile okay. space. Is that service by Smart? Yes, yeah. and that's because okay. we're overwhelming yeah. the right. connector buses. <coughs> Yeah, which we don't have a, we work, our people at Lansing work a little bit with SMART, but we don't have control over okay. that. So what we hear, definitely hear you on that. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Troy. He's going to talk about the legislation. As Representative uh, Hobbs mentioned earlier, in October of 2001, Governor Snyder uh, did his special message on infrastructure and um, from that message uh, they put together a 17 bill uh, package that dealt with uh, both the delivery of road and uh, transit ser services at the state and local level and required uh, best practices for recipients to, uh, to demonstrate for future funding and require more uh, trans um, transparent reporting of benchmarks and progress. It also uh, raised revenue through registration fees and a wholesale tax on uh, fuel uh, to preserve our transportation resources at acceptable levels instead of the sharp and predictable uh, declines in quality uh, that Kurt and Dennis have uh, outlined. So those bills were introduced on uh, January 26, uh, 2012. Um, they were referred, most of them were referred to the House and uh, Senate Standing Committees on Transportation, which uh, the House Committee is chaired by uh, State Representative um, Opsimer from the uh, Lans Lansing area, he's actually north of Lansing in the DeWitt area, and the Senate Transportation Commission is, or committee is chaired by uh, Senator Tom Casperson from Escanaba in the Upper Peninsula. Um, so we've been working with both committee chairs uh, and uh, other and members of the committee um, on those bills. Um, a few of them have seen um, hearings, but none have been taken up for a vote. The most important are the funding bills in the package are House Bill uh, 5298, which was introduced by State Representative uh, Olson from Washtenaw County, and Senate Bill 918, uh, introduced by Senator Kahn from the Saginaw area. The, we've introduced companion bills in each chamber, so they're identical bills to try to move them uh, through the chamber equally. Um, Senate, House Bill 5298 and Senate Bill 918 convert the uh, current fuel taxes to a wholesale tax away from the uh, at the pump uh, tax. It would uh, limit the bill, or it would, limits in the bill would ensure that the tax could neither increase nor decrease more than one cent per year after the initial year, and the current rate of 19 cents per gallon would be replaced by a wholesale uh, tax with the effective rate of 28.3 cents per gallon. And then, as was mentioned earlier, the current diesel discount of 4 cents uh, per gallon plus numerous other exemptions for vehicles owned by local governments, school buses, transit agencies, and nonprofit agencies would also end. Uh, the bill is projected to raise uh, 541 million annually. But certainly. What's going to stop the wholesalers from transferring the cost right back to the consumer at the pump? Well, that, I mean that's a good question, but that no, it's all goes. Yeah. But it goes he back to. He's not going to be operating at a deficit, so he's. I mean, is there any language? It's in there for any protection, or is, do we just expect that what you just said just shifts right back as we pick up the phone and put it under there? Well, it goes back to that um, it's really a user fee, um, you know, that it, it's a user fee to use our road.
both and sit out. Um, so, I mean, you're probably exactly right that it will be transferred back to the consumer. So why are we bothering with that? <laughs> it, it, it just seems to me like we should be finding something objective that we can solve some problems without always passing it back to the consumer. Which is exactly what a wholesale is going to do. Well, that's that's why we're here to talk about this, and, and, and you know, to be very blunt with you, uh, you know, look, these are there. There was a group of people that met for a very long time uh, around these fields to really develop these fields and you know, identify the problem. And I think that you know the panel has done an excellent job in describing what the problem is. I think we all can agree to that. We understand what the problem is. Uh, the, these are the solutions that have been put forth by a lot, you know, several folks that spent a lot of time in the room talking about how, how do we raise revenue? You know, this is the problem. How much is it going to cost? Where do we get the revenue from? What's the most, what, what is the most balanced way that we can come up with a solution to pay for our roads in the future? Because, and give me one second, because the, the question is, is, is not, it, it, it the answer can't be we do nothing. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, so, so, so let's start there, that we all understand that the answer is not to do nothing. But the answer is to do something. So this is what people have come up with. This, these are our conversation starters. Uh, you know, and so take it for that. Take it that you know, this is what we want to start the conversation with. Uh, because I'm telling you, there, there are individuals who spent their careers in transportation. You know, that said, hey, look, we're trying to find alternatives here. But at the end of the day, this is what you're going to be left with. This is, you know, like uh, Meryl said, you know, uh, you know, before. They came to us, they, they came to you guys for 10 cents, I mean, 10 cents. They only got four. And they got four, right? And so these are the conversations that we're starting. So we'll take it from there, okay? And we have a couple more questions. Not to say we're going to do this quite yet. This is why I want to talk to you, right? So, so that I know that I'm going to get an email from you if this actually goes through. I want to know who I'm going to get my emails from, right? So, 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 so go ahead. It seems to me that there's a conspiracy to destroy municipalities because, once again, you're taking money away from municipalities with this bill, and that goes along with refuses in revenue sharing, reductions in money from personal property and a whole variety of other things. Most municipalities have a terrible time balancing their budget and this makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And then we have one more one more comment on your question. I just had a I just had a small question and, and I think this is I appreciate the fact that you use the term conversation starters. This is a conversation that definitely needs to happen because I mean if you look at the data, I mean it's becoming increasingly losable battle. I mean, it, it's harder and harder to even eke out a victory when your funding is getting slashed every year and the things become more expensive with time to repair. And just in the spirit of, of continuing that conversation that started, I, I wonder, and, and I apologize if I missed it, if it's, if it's something that's already been talked about, but the leveraging mass transit as a solution, I, I don't know that it gets the, the priority that it should. I mean, when you look at when you look at the state transportation budget, and this isn't about nailing anybody to the wall. This is just sort of like I feel like it's a result of decades of a certain attitude. You know, we're mm -hmm. a motor city, we're yep. a motor region, and you look at the state transportation budget. Eighty-six point four percent goes toward highways and roads. Nine nine point six goes toward mass transit, and that's split between seventy-nine transit agencies, all the local, smart, VDOT. And I feel like while that is in place. I don't know how you can get from that picture on the left to the picture on the right. You could do it in some places, but as it gets more and more expensive, I, I, you know, I wonder, you know, the, the goal is to move people around and to increase economic development. And you see regions all over the place that are doing well, that, that transit is important. And actually, I've done a really good job of incorporating mass transit into its plan. But I think the missing piece, and again, it's not nailing anybody to the wall or anything, but I think the missing piece is that priority is not set in budget. And I feel like that's... All right, so on, on that note, I'm gonna have Troy finish uh, because he may he may address some of the questions that have come up. So and we'll move uh, then. Then we'll kind of get to the question uh, and conversation period. <laughs> <laughs> and then 52.99 and 9.20 would uh, bring about the diesel parity issue, and that's the increase the 15 cents on diesel fuel. Uh, and bring it in line with the gas tax instead of there being two different taxes on diesel fuel and on gas tax. Okay. And then House Bill uh, 5300 and Senate Bill 919 
Uh, Senate, um, House Bill 5300 is uh, sponsored by Representative Gilbert from the St. Clair area, who's a former uh, Transportation Committee Chair of the Senate. Um, he was in the Senate for eight years and then came over to the House. Um, and then Senate Bill 919, sp uh, sponsored by Senator Kahn from the Saginaw <coughs> area, would increase the statewide registration fees uh, for most passenger vehicles by 67%. And it would be based on uh, weight-based fees for commercial trucks would increase by 25%. Uh, both of these are likely to also be effective at a loss of, uh, this, of diesel discount, um, which was in the previous bill. Uh, this would raise an estimated that, uh, $500 million for uh, transportation purposes. The bill would also dedicate revenue to the Michigan Transportation Fund. Uh, and then there's a schedule of distributions which would shift the proportion of funding to the, um, to the MTF and the Commercial Corridor Fund so that the Commercial Corridor Fund will receive all the registration fee revenue by 2021 uh, fiscal period. And that bill, um, is the Commercial Corridor Fund bill is the one that actually received most um, attention in the House at this time. They've um, done quite a few hearings on it and that one continues to be worked on by Representative Olson um, to establish how that fund would be set up and then to go back and uh, and work on the funding pieces of it. So, and then there's other numerous bills and I can even, I have cards that I can uh, give you. about the, uh, the regional transit? Oh, certainly. There's, there's a, uh, the, the regional transit bills are uh, Those are um, introduced by, uh, it, those again are two how, our companion bills, and it's House Bill 5309 introduced by Representative Townsend from the Royal Oak area, and Senate Bill 909 uh, introduced by Senator Tom Casterson from Escanaba, and they would uh, create a new regional transit authority in southeast Michigan. Uh, this would include Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and Washtenaw counties at first, but other counties can petition to join. The new authority would have broad powers to administer transit on a regional basis. Among the powers would be the ability to ask voters to approve a special assessment to support the transit. The authority would also be specifically empowered to develop a rolling rapid transit system along the Woodward uh, Corridor, uh, Gratiot Avenue, and unidentified routes with one connecting Detroit and Mount Clemens and another connecting Ann Arbor and Detroit. As of July 25th, um, there was regional transit authority uh, hearings held in the Senate and the Senate uh, committee adopted uh, a substitute Senate bill um, and it's now on the Senate floor. So that, um, that package of bills is awaiting um, work on by the full uh, Senate at this time. Are these bills all just introduced and have nothing passed? Everything you just talked about? Correct. No, all 17 bills have just been introduced, but and uh, just a few have seen work in the committee, but so none have actually been brought to the floor and passed. Question. Um, one of the things that I've seen is that with your regional transit is it's just like you voted back the first part of August. The extended 5.9 percent tax, but they didn't include no new city getting into it. Like I live close to Wilker Village, they just eliminated all the service there because because they're not paying no money for Smart to keep going. That's right. Because well, they, they got a so they they I they, I they, 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 they ran they both they ran as long as you got a Republican in the. He's going to want, he doesn't want to give the money to keep Detroit going. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, just like she brought up, a, I brought up a point. Let me put it to you like this. If they change, like last year, they wanted to stop, they're not going to run disturbing buses. But in the rush hour, they run downtown still. Because that's what the people want. You know, I mean, it's a, if somebody's in a wheelchair, get off one bus just to get on another one. And bus 
Arabs are not the most cooperative type of people. You know what I mean? You can't, you know, I can ride out, I know I can get the thing, because I can get it, I can ride, be on the only one on the bus to ride from Southfield to downtown Detroit for three hours. Which I already know that I can ride the other buses for free, because I worked there for so many years. See, so what, you know what I mean? And if I'm the only one on that bus, it's, you, that's why these buses are running around in circles. Like, I know somebody who works for Troy, Troy and probably sounds in the same way. They only go into certain areas. You know what I mean? So, the city buses, and, and then, if, you know, people don't want to transfer. You know, I mean, first thing, it's hard to do, you know, I, it's easier for me, if you don't drive, there's, there's one of your biggest problems right there. Well, I mean, just like right now, the 12 mile bus, because nobody doesn't want to be part of part, you can't get off the 12 volts. People got to walk from Haggerty off the 12 volts. You know what I mean? You know, it, I, I was just going to say, I, I can see from the group that um, public transit is a very important issue. And maybe what we c I can work with Representative Hobbs and we can have another one of these and I can bring, we can come back with the Lansing staff that works yeah. on public transit issues and sit down and have a discussion with them and some of the folks from SMART and maybe do, you know, we'll touch on it a little, we'll touch on it a little bit and we'll try to fill out all the questions uh, as best we can as it relates to uh, public transit. I'm a huge supporter of public transit and you know, having a regional system. Uh, and I can share some of my thoughts uh, about that. But before we do that, uh, this gentleman here had a question. Yeah, I was going to you talk about MDOT's uh, long range plan draft and how people can comment on that. Yes. I, Kurt, can you? Yes, I can touch on that. It's actually the microphone on the table, too. Yes, we are currently soliciting input on our. Uh, Long range plan, we updated it. Um, it's a uh, 25 year plan, I believe, um, and we just updated it. It's uh, part of our federal requirements to receive federal funds. And it is, I will get a, if you want to get with me after this, and I can get you um, the email ad, or not the email, but the web address to access that state, lo state long range plan. But we are soliciting comments, and actually, they're online. So if you have access to the internet, you can get on there, look at it. If you have comments, make sure you submit those on there. And uh, we receive all those comments, and we're required to respond or at least look at those comments and try to incorporate those into the, uh, the long-range plan. And obviously, transit, from the, what I'm getting here, is resonating. And uh, make sure that you guys get those opinions um, and your feelings in there about transit so we can maybe strengthen that in our long-range plan. Where? Right through Village voted not to use the smart. Yes, and they opted out. All those cities that opt out are passed through. If you use it, you pay for it. And if you're not going to pay for it in your taxes, let it be. I mean, either you're in or you're out. Or there's got to be some kind of new law. I, I agree. You know, one of the things that you know I, I share with folks in Lansing as we talk about you know these regional systems is that you know you can't allow. And this is my personal opinion. Okay, my personal opinion. You can't allow communities to opt out. Uh, I think that you know it, you, communities must you know uh, be part of our regional system. It makes no sense for nobody to opt out. And, you know, look, you have a major mall. You know, people people want to go to the mall. It, it makes no sense to have to walk, uh, you know, take a long walk to the mall once you get off the bus. You know, in other I mean, other states, I mean, you know, most malls are the hub. You know, the North Plain is a hub. Uh, so I, I just think that it makes sense, you know, especially as you, you go up the spokes, you know, as you go up Gratia, as you come up Telegraph, as you go over 12 Mile. You know, these are major, uh, these, are, these are major roads uh, in our community, and I think that every community along these major roads should have stops. But I have my own reason about why they opt out. So, uh, Herman? Going back to uh, the funding, right now we're paying 19 cents a gallon as a pump. You're saying that we're going to 
you can always make it this back, we're going to uh, put it on the wholesale price to the wholesale distributor at 29 cents a gallon. Right? What it comes back to is, because as a wholesaler, I agree with this young, young lady, that he's going to pass that 29 cents back to us, and we're going to suck up the uh, 9 cents more, paying 9 cents more at the pump instead of a decrease. We're going to be charged more at the pump for having the wholesaler pay. Troy, let me just jump in real quick. Uh, when, when we first. Like top position A, you know. When we first introduced the package, uh, a lot of the uh, media outlets were saying that it's going to be an extra nine cent per gallon. Does that number still kind of stand there? That's that's the uh, taking it from the 19 to the 28, right? Okay. So it'll be. So you're right. I mean, it, it will get passed back to us, no doubt about it. It'll be an extra nine cent uh, at the pump. So whatever you see, that I think the gas I put in my car today was uh, 407. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so you just add an extra nine cents to that, and that's what uh, the gas, that's what the gas prices will be if this legislation were to move forward. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I really want to talk about with you guys. I mean, that's this this is where it gets to the crux, you know, of the conversation. Uh, give me one second. This is this is what I really want to get the feedback from everyone to talk about because we understand the problem. You know, how do we pay for the solution? Uh, <coughs> Sorry to interrupt you. I do have the website for our state monitoring plan. And actually, comments are due tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out there for a couple of weeks. Here it is. Ready? www.michigan.gov forward slash FLRP. You type that in, it'll take you into our state long range plan. If forward you can't, slash what? Can you just use the microphone there? Oh. Yes www.michigan.gov forward slash S L R P. If you type that in, it's not, it's on our front page of our MDOT website, which is that same Michigan.gov forward slash M D O T. It's rolling across on the front on the front page. So just wait, there's like a <coughs> banner that has other like topics that come up. It's one of the topics that'll come up on your banner. So the comments are due tomorrow. Thank you. Yep. Sean, you had a question? Well, sure. First of all, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight and give us an opportunity to interact with you guys on the decision making process, information gathering process. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on how this cost is not going to get transferred back to the consumer. I it will, and not say it, right? Yeah. And we need to register your car. No, 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 no. Other, other industrialized countries, like let's say China, they got a lot of jobs, right? They do a lot with bikes. I don't really, I ride my bike a lot because I just can't afford the gas prices and all those stuff. What are we going to do? We need more more bike roads or bike paths. Anything in the budget for that? Any planning for that? Uh, does that fall into your 25 year? Yeah, that would be in the state, that would be in that state long range plan. It'll identify what our goals are for for non motorized. We call non motorized facilities. They'll identify that. If you get on our website and look at that piece, you could probably even search through the documents and you have to go through the whole thing. It'll basically lay out what our plan is for 25 years for non motorized facilities. But with the passing of the complete street policy, all that stuff, the bicyclists, uh, the the people who walk, the pedestrians. The transit piece, all that stuff we're supposed to look at when we do a road project, at least take into consideration and try to incorporate as much as we can, as much that much as uh, that is feasible. But on the, as far as bicycles go, we're, we've got a big push to try to incorporate uh, bicycle lanes or, or or markings on our projects. So, yep. I know one thing I've been doing as a project manager is when we um, are starting a project, I would sit down with <coughs> the communities and. We always look to see where there's goat paths have been worn, and we know we're going to put sidewalk or a path there. And then we also look or sit down with the communities and we find out what their goals are for their um, non-motorized facilities, and we try to incorporate whatever we can afford to in our projects at the time. And a lot of times it might end up being 100% <coughs> community funded because MDOT wouldn't have the funding, but we include it with our, our bid package and that way they get a lot lower um, bid prices. So we are trying to do that already 
and um, and sometimes we can and sometimes we can't, but we do the best we can with the money we have. Yep. And then what, what role does local government, local uh, city councils, uh, what role does local government play in terms of the uh, walkable paths, the bike paths, and things of that nature? Do they play any role in, in terms of, you know, setting out a vision uh, for that community and working within that? They yeah. have, um, like, usually most communities will have a master plan that they have created for their um, non-motorized facilities, and that's what we want to see, and we actually work with them to help them get that on our roads, because, you know, like Dixie Highway goes through Clarkston and Springfield Township and Independence Township, so, you know, as an example, so we'll work with them to see what is in their master plan and what we can include in our project. So we're going to do uh, Northwestern Highway. We're going to strike that white shoulder. Right. Yep. Yeah, the project I'm working on right now, we just resurfaced M10 Northwestern Highway from basically 12 Mile to um, to Orchard Lake Road, and we're going to include a bike lane. We're That's awesome. Because the more them. you bike, the less you're driving, the less you're putting wear and tear on the road. Right. right. Are the uh, the funding legislation that you were talking about is that going to support any of the investment in transit and bicycling and sidewalks and so forth, or is that just going to deal with? No, that this trans this transportation package is a multimodal transportation package. It, it, it looks at the um, system needs across all of the modes of of the transportation of transportation. And then just to share with us, uh, we someone showed a chart earlier that talks that, that rated our roads to show where our roads were in terms of ratings. Yep. Uh, if we were to make this significant investment in our roads uh, through these uh, package of bills, where would that take our rating to? Uh, do, do we have that type of information? Yeah, it's um, actually if you look at the uh, pay now or pay later chart, and on the left hand side. Um, it shows what the percent good is fair, and this is forecasting. If we were to get, um, if we were able to match all of our federal aid, that, that top line, with an additional $845 million a year, which I think actually we're pushing for more than that, or the legislature we're talking about, the governor at least was pushing for more than that, um, we would be able to keep it right around, uh, at least for the state system now, this isn't the local system, let's make sure that that's clear, this is the state trunk line system, I routes, US, M routes, that we'd be at roughly anywhere from 80 to 90 percent in good condition. So that's that. If you look on the left hand side, that's what that, that states there. So, and right now we're, we're falling way short of that, so. Okay. Okay, what I was going to ask about is that, um, you know, I don't know, this seems like this is, I uh, maybe I'm wrong, but this is just the main, main um, road, but I know Southfield, um, I have a daughter with special needs also, and I'm trying to get her out riding, walking up and down, and she has a wheelchair, and, um, you know, we don't have sidewalk in my neighborhood, and, and just even taking her over to uh, Lincoln, and, and Southfield Road, you know, even that is there's no sidewalk there. You're in Lakeland so Village? I'm in, I'm in Southfield. Mm -hmm. Right off of Lakeland Village. Yeah, a lot of Southfield streets are going to be on sidewalks. So, um, you know, will all of this have any effect on, on these community mm -hmm. streets? Uh, probably in an indirect way, I would say. Uh, I think most, I think you know, we have a classification in terms of you know, who's responsible for roads, right? I think in uh, the city of Southfield, uh, neighborhood streets uh, rest with the uh, city of Southfield. Uh, we have two councilmen here. If you could help me answer that question, it'd be appreciated. Yeah, people want to have sidewalks in their, in their streets. So what they have to do is they have to get 60% of the people on that street to sign a petition that they want to be special assessed. They have sidewalks put in. Now, special Most assessed. Let's, let's make sure everybody understands. Oh, they all understand. Okay, everybody understands. <laughs> 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 I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, but you have to have 60% or more of the, the people. If there are two people on the deed of the house, you have to get both in the sign. So, if 60%, if there's less than 
50%, it won't fly. So, uh, in today's environment, it's going to be pretty hard to get 60% of the people to add more taxes to their... Uh, but that's how sidewalks get put in. In Southfield. Typically, how long is the assessment? How long is it? Uh, 15 years, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Off that. We're working in the DDA right now and with um, the city center plan. There, it, the plans are being drawn up. We are creating between uh, the colleges for bike paths. And that, and the, what the happens college, now? Oakland Community we're, College, Morris Tech. Yeah, from, from our area over at City Center, Lawrence Tech, uh, and if we're putting it in, now we're working on it, what happens when funding for that comes along? I don't have an answer to that here. I know what you would like my answer to <laughs> 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 Yes, ma'am. Somebody just mentioned Orchard Lake Road. That has to be one of the worst in the world. I'm sorry, one more time. They did some of this last year. I don't know what it was. I was sure they were going to get to this really sad part around 14 Mile where there are all those stores. They're there now. They're there now. Yeah. I was just, I was just there getting gas uh, yesterday. Yeah, they're there now. And they're done? Uh, no. Not done. I want to reiterate speaking for the mayor of the, uh, of the city of uh, Oak Park that any increase in our expenses through the stack tax, this the gas tax you're talking about, will be harmful to us in a very significant way. We've already had to lay out 15 police officers. We're trying to bring them back through special taxes. But here you are going to add several thousand dollars more to our budget, and we're we're really scraping just to make it. I have, a, I have an overall question in regard to um, the second gentleman there with the blue shirt on. <laughs> you had a, a whole list of bills that were coming up. Yes. And um, I understand that all of that is, is under discussion. What I'm interested in knowing, and um, maybe I can see this um, online, maybe I can't. Um, some of what, some of these bills, or, or it seems to me like most of these bills, um, were going to be based on either taxes, and I'm, I'm, when I say taxes, I, I got a question mark there because I don't know <coughs> what you mean taxes in terms of based in our real estate uh, tax structure, or if you're referring to taxes like with the difference with the um, gas, uh, the gas is it just from the gas tax perspective? So what my interest is, is, is this. Is there a way, because the easiest way, and I don't know about y'all, but the easiest way for me to understand money <laughs> is to find a base. If, for example, a piece of those things that are property-based relative on all the bills that you propose, if a piece of property left given a, a $100,000 base number. Which of those bills will apply to that property tax scenario at what cost per $100,000 of real estate value versus the, the gas tax scenarios and the bills that you have proposed that you have you know, currently proposing for those, what's the impact on that either by what? We, we, you know, I, I think I, I think I shared that with you when uh, when we first when I, when I just started this section here, uh, nine cent. The, so that's that's, that's the nine cent number. If, if these were to go through, uh, all bills that he ran over. Well, what, what, well, well, uh, well there, there was there's probably three that he really talked about. Uh, there was the one that had to do with the gas tax. That's nine cent. Okay. Two, it was the registration. So when we go to register our cars. 67% uh, on average, right? So average means there's going to be some below. You know, look, if you, I can't afford those cars where it's going to be high. But 
That's, and that's based on weight, right? And then there is the uh, authority. Uh, the authority, but they, the authority will have the ability to come to voters and ask for a special assessment, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. All right, so that's the one that will be based on real estate. That will, so that's the one that will be based on real estate. So, but that, again, this is giving them the authority to come and ask you mm -hmm. and make the case to you. Uh, this is what we would like to see in terms of a special assessment. I'm gonna just say taxes, right? So this is what we this is what we want to tax you uh, to pay for a uh, regional authority. And I can so those three. Okay, and all of that's understandable. My response to that, as an individual voter, well, no, would be, I got you. Would be you want to know how much it'll cost you? Well, no, I do. I understand that, but the other part of costing me is what is my benefit in my community in my general area. What kind of specific improvement can I look for if I'm going to say yes to these assessment taxes? This lady up here has a typical example. She has a special needs child, but she doesn't feel like 10 miles is even in the program. Okay, we've got to have some kind of protection for children, for bike paths, for um, disability people. If all of that can be shown to us to say here are the here are the enhancements and the things that we that you would be paying for in your general area, in your county, in my function, then don't come to me. Because I wanna you know, it's like Ms. Jackson said, I wanna see what you're gonna do for me later. <laughs> and I don't mean to be negative. But politics is low Unfortunately, our money is local too, and we've got to figure out a way where y'all can present to us, and we've got a way for us to present to y'all. You right. can explain that all easy. I'm more interested in, let's get the turnaround right there. Just, I can speak on behalf of okay. MDOT. We've got a rolling five-year plan, and that's on our website too. If you get to our website, or if you type it into Google, you can find that also. Well, we, right now we've got a plan out to 2017, mm -hmm. um, which will show you what work that we have. Um, Lori's actually got a list for Oakland County here that we got planned for roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've had to do actually in the last few years because of the activity <coughs> of funding, is we actually had to go and actually show or highlight or shade projects that were on that list because we weren't sure if we were going to get the money to do it or not. Um, so, but now with the somewhat stable funding that we're getting at least for 13, we haven't had to do that. We haven't had to highlight. But if you go down there, you can see what we're proposing over the next five years, and we'll add another year this year, 2018. My point so. here is, I, if, 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 if voters don't understand, they're not going to get your funding. Right. I, I agree with you. Know? I agree with you. What, what are you going to get out of it in your right. community? Exactly. I mean, and if it's not, that's, 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 that's that makes you know, perfect you're going to have to sit right. there in front of me and say, well, I'm sorry, Ms. Lyons, you're getting
in Moss, and, and I'm going to just say this before he, he speaks. Uh, I, I really believe that Councilman Moss, I mean, this, this is a dynamic young man. Uh, when he uh, was at a debate in this room, uh, that question came up of transportation and roads and things of that nature. And he made an excellent point in terms of roads. And he was talking about this road that's right out here in front of us, uh, Evergreen Road. And he, he shared, and if there's one thing that resonated with me, you know, uh, during that debate, it's, it stuck with me to this day, and I'm sharing it with you, uh, because that's how important it was. He was saying how, you know, how beat up Evergreen Road is, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the road that welcomes you, you know, to our civic center, to the heart of our city. To, you know, this is where, you know, people play baseball, kids to come play on playgrounds. We have this wonderful library here. We have our city hall here, Parks and Rec. And then this is what greets you and welcomes you into our city. Uh, so I'm sure he's going to have some great words to share about transportation and what you will get. So I, I just put the pressure on you. Yeah, that's quite an introduction <laughs> to that. Um, <laughs> what I was going to address to your point specific, and I think my, uh, Councilman Frager can can chime in. Our city planner was just here, candidly, I was actually talking in the, out in the hallway about this. We as a city council early, earlier this year passed a non-motorized transportation plan, which takes into account everything you were talking about. We identified the intersections within the city of Southfield where there's the highest uh, incident rate between a car and a pedestrian, the highest incident rate between uh, a, a car and a bicycle. So the city is doing a proactive approach by identifying those intersections and those corridors so when state funding becomes available, those are priority projects. So that does impact most local neighborhoods. But something that I, I think that uh, I'm pushing for heavily, and I know that Councilman Frazier is too, talking about making this corridor more walkable, uh, a more walkable community. And I know that Evergreen Road is slated to be, to be redone within the next coming years. Um, so that's something that we take into account uh, on, the, on the onset. Where are the, the highest priorities of needing to really retool the sidewalk, needing to retool tool the road, and when funding becomes available through Representative Haas or, or through the state, that's our priority list laid out. And is that priority list including these two areas? It's, yep, it's throughout the whole city. The whole map of the city was actually a page in this plan that literally has dots over the last, it must have been 10 years or something like that, dot of incident between pedestrians and cars, between bicycles and cars. And, you know, some of them had bigger dots on them because there are more incidents. Yeah. And obviously those are the priorities. If it's happening repeatedly, you know, we got to look at it more seriously. So the city is doing a proactive approach so that when funding comes down through the state to the city, we know where to go right away. So, I don't know if I'm going to No, no, no that's, that's, the, you know, that's something I was going to say. You know, these these dollars that, that the state will come asking for, and they will come asking, trust me, uh, uh, those dollars, you know, we want to pump those dollars into communities, right, so that we can make our communities uh, in, in this, you know, around the state, you know, more walkable. I mean, that's, these are where all the communities around the country are going to be more walkable, bikeable, uh, easier to get around. Uh, those are things that we need to do to improve our state because, look, when businesses come here, and this is one thing, you know, I, I've had lots of experiences as a state representative that I've mm -hmm. never been able to have. But I was sitting in a room with uh, a Fortune 500 company right here in Southfield that's having a transportation road bridge issue. You know, I mean, you know, these, these are the little things, I mean, that, that, that keep businesses in the community. Uh, you know, one, one of the things they were talking about in terms of, uh, you know, Evergreen, you know, people that are working right here um, at the town center, they, they don't like Evergreen. You know, we, we have companies approaching, you know, the city's office and saying, what are you going to do about it? Uh, R.L. Polk, you know, there, there's some things that you have to do to get major corporations to move into your community. And transportation is a huge piece of that. I mean, that's one of the first things they want to talk about. Uh, you know, so these, these are these are these are positives. I mean, you know, look, we're not just asking for you know you to kick over another non-cent every time you go fill up. I fill up every other day, but you know, every time you fill up once a week or twice a week, whatever it is, whatever it is you do, we're talking about making an investment in Michigan. And I'll tell you one other piece <coughs> that comes out of it, and that's jobs. You know, when, when people, when, you know, I try not to get frustrated. I live uh, with Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, no, he, he knows. So when we come on our subdivision, right, and you turn on to 11 Mile, you're stuck in traffic for the next 15 minutes because, you know, I'm looking at Lawson. I mean, I'm looking at Lawson. I'm sitting there, you know. You keep looking at it. Yeah, you can't cut through the 
Doom Dog, you know, parking lot because the police is sitting there, right? <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I mean, so we, we, you know, I try not to get frustrated because I know that there are, are men and women working. And because they're working, they're paying bills. Because they're paying bills, they're paying taxes. Because they're paying taxes, you know, my three daughters are able to go, you know, to a uh, great school. You know, so I, 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 I mean, I understand the larger picture. And we have to do a better job at, 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 at putting this thing in uh, larger context in terms of just saying, hey, look, uh, gas is already high, we need you to pay 9 more cents. But, you know, and we're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to make that case uh, to every voter. Because I do want to go back to office when you, you know, in two years. So I don't want you guys to be mad at me when it's going to pass, you know, pass it through and somebody else runs and kick me out because, you know, I voted for something like this. So, you know, but we, 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 we try to make sure that you understand what we want to do with these dollars. And at the end of the day, you know, these dollars, this package of bills will make this area competitive. We have to make the transition in, in the southeast, you know, Detroit area. We have to. You know, look, we, we are a, we are an older community that wants a younger, you know, talented, work-based to come here. <coughs> and it's difficult. You know, my brother, you know, we all grew up here in Southfield. We all went to Southfield Public Schools. But both of my brothers, you know, one is in New York. He's never coming back. He always tells me, Rudy, I don't even need a car out here. <laughs> you know, that's, 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 uh, that's a car note and insurance. And parking. Pay a parking. That he's that he's saving, right? I mean, that's 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 one bill he does not have to worry about. You know, my brother in D.C. with his family, when they want to go into uh, D.C., they on a train. They catch a bus. There's no opt outs. They can get off at any bus stop they want to. You know, and not have to walk a mile and a half to get somewhere. You know, so I mean. These are the areas that we're competing with. And if we want to make this region competitive, and I'm committed to doing that, uh, we, we have to put the investment in it. And, and I understand how difficult it is for all of us because I'm pinching pennies just like you're pinching pennies. You know, I'm sending the daughter to college next year. You know, I already told my wife, hey, stop buying stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, we, you know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I understand that we're all pinch of pennies. You know, however, you know, it's worth it. At the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. You know, I, I know, uh, and I, I'll talk politics for a hot second, okay? I'll try not to get into too much politics. Because, you know, I invite everyone here. This is not a Democratic club meeting. I invite everyone. So, uh, but, you know, look, these bills raise taxes. These bills are sponsored by Republicans. And Don, you can close your ears if you want to. Uh, but, you know, Republicans don't go out and just raise taxes. Trust me. I know. The, these, are, these are very difficult bills to get through the House. The people who put their names on these bills, you have to believe that they have heard from their constituents and some of their colleagues that says, there's no way in the world I'm voting for anything that raised any tax in the state of Michigan. And those people, in my opinion, just don't get it. We have to start somewhere. And, and, these, and these Republicans who put their names on this bill, they took a step towards the middle. And we always say about Republicans, they never can take a step towards the middle. They never can cross the aisle and work with us. Well, this is an issue that I would give Snyder credit, that he is trying to work across the aisle, and he's trying to figure out how do we move this region, how do we move this state forward. And I will give him credit for that, and I will work with him every day of the week on this issue. You know, and so what I, what I say to my constituents, you know, this is something that I'm passionate about. And I hope that you guys are just going to be just as passionate about it also. Because <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, it is going to help our state. At the end of the day. So, uh, I'll, answer any, I'll answer any other questions. And then I'm no, because someone already talked to me in the hallway about the bridge issue. So if anybody have any questions about the bridge, I'm open to answer those too. I love talking politics. Go My for next it. question is that um, now, if we pass this, I mean, nine, we got nine cents. Okay, say it's passed. Okay. We got nine cents. That's a start. Okay. That's a great conversation start. <laughs> is that going to be 
enough to make it the roads the way they should be. I mean, because you said it should be nine cents. It should have been nine cents. How many years ago? I'm um, she, she, years she's ago. speaking to the inflation piece. Yeah. Okay, now, is that going to be enough? Now, remember so this. There's, 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 there's another piece to this that's going to raise another uh, $500 million, like 541 and that was the registration piece. So it's not just the 9%, nine, the nine cents cent. on the gas, but it's okay. also another piece coupled with it. Uh, so... I, I would say that, you know, they, they gave careful careful consideration in terms of, look, we don't want to come back and nip on dying people every five years. This is a right. tough enough conversation already, right? We want to have this conversation once, you know, every 15 years or so, not, you know, once every other year. Uh, so I think that people are giving us enough careful consideration to think about, you know, down the road, you know, where we want to be, how much, how much dollars we need to raise locally to leverage dollars from D.C., uh, so I, I was I would trust that the people that were in this room have given that uh, a lot of thought, and I would say yes. And we have to remember that this conversation started um, under the over, under Governor Granholm's administration as well with the Transportation Funding True. Task Force. So this yeah. conversation has been ongoing for uh, four years now, um, and it's been a, it's been one of the one of the central issues in Lansing for four years. That, that's actually a very, if you're interested in this, in transportation, that's a very good read too, the, trans, the report, the bipartisan group that was commissioned by uh, Governor Granholm in the, yeah. the legislature in 2008, and they came together and uh, came up with a recommendation on funding for transportation and what would be needed to keep a state of good repair. And so if you type transportation funding task force, report Michigan in Google, it'll come up. You can read and, that. And then that report was from that work, then Representative Rick Olson from Washtenaw County and Roy Schmidt from Representative Roy Schmidt from uh, Kent County, they took that report and, and and from the House Standing Committee on Transportation did a subcommittee and worked on their own report and and ca continue to update those findings. Um, and R Representative Olson has just done a best practices conference uh, in Lansing. He's working very diligently on it, and then. Um, citizens such as Jim Shea has uh, uh, taken this I issue up and working, you know, at, in this setting up meetings like this across the state to continue to work on it and uh, show how important this, this conversation is um, and bring it outside of Lansing to the constituents. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. So uh, we'll go ahead with Councilman Frazier. Yeah, um, <coughs> Frazier may all be mad at me, but. Uh, adding nine cents to the uh, uh, gas tax, in my opinion, is like adding a putting an addition on a buggy with factory. With the cafe standards going up to 54 miles, there's not going to be that many gallons of gas being sold. We have to come up with a completely new way of funding roads and bridges and sidewalks and and, and streets and and bike paths. My question is. Who's thinking about that, and what's being done so that uh, at that crossover point when we need to change the way we do funding, that it's a smooth transition, and we're not sitting here in a room hollering at you guys because you haven't even thought about it, because it's coming. And what about electric cars? Well, that's part of it. I think that you can talk about it. No. <laughs> what we're working on is with the Road Commission for Oakland County is it's called a mileage based user fee and that is that the change from a gas tax to pay for by the miles you drive. But essentially that's a gas tax. But it, because of hybrids and electrics they won't be using fuel or as much fuel. You go to a mileage based user fee. There's a number of state DOTs across the country that are working on this. There's been pilots and Washington and Oregon and Minnesota. Uh, the Road Commission, we're involved with a lot of these groups because we think that's the future. That would be the fairest way to charge is based on the number of miles you drive. Now, you know, the technology's out there to do it. There's concerns about Big Brother watching where people are at. It's kind of in its infancy, but 
that's the way, the long term or a long range goal to address that problem of decreasing revenues from gas tax. Okay, so Oakland County is doing it. What about all the rest of the counties in Michigan? Well, we're, we're involved in it. It's, it's still not to the point where it's going to work. There's lots of issues. We can work them out if you go across state lines. How do you share the mileage? But first, the first steps are to make sure the technology works, and there's a number of states that say, yeah, the technology works. So it's in its infancy, but there are people looking at saying the gas tax is not going to be the long-term solution. All that said, there's those issues to work out, and we're probably eight to ten years away from seeing that being the mainstay. So in the intermediate time, we have to do something now, and the most logical thing is to address it through the gas tax. So electric cars and hybrids are still a real small percent of the fleet. <coughs> Are we free to make any comments regarding the discussions tonight? Uh, I'm sorry I didn't read the plan that the state has. Uh, it probably would have maybe saved me some time and use some time as well. I'm going to read some comments, and I'm going to read them because I don't want to turn a five-second comment into a sleep-inducing event. Uh, I want to thank uh, State Representative Robbie Hout for inviting me here, and I'm very pleasantly surprised that we had so many fine officials attending and other representatives. The comments that I'm going to make below are only a few, but I made a few of the ones that I made to Governor Rick Snyder back in May of 2011. He astonished me by responding on more than one occasion. My comments were intended to uh, improve traffic flow, reduce accidents, and therefore reduce costs to government <coughs> and the citizenry, citizenry throughout the state. I'm going to just briefly mention them. I've got details for all of them. But I think what we need, first of all, is a comprehensive plan that will, uh, and a sustained plan to restore order to our driving habits, logic to our road planning and repair decisions, and constant attention to the traffic control decisions. Any plan that we have which is unenforced is a waste of time and will only breed resentment in the future. So it has to be well thought out. Some of the important things are, and I'm not going to beat it to death, stop shoddy short life road repairs, we all know about it, on the positive end in the last eight months to ten months throughout the entire metro region, I'm seeing better repairs. And it, it looks like some of them are going to be quite significant. So as bad as some of it has been, I see something on the other end developing. Uh, on the traffic lights that are now popping up here and there, this new four lens light, which I just noticed over here at 12 Mile and Lasser, don't do it. First of all, they're creating a lot of confusion. They are dangerous. They are unnecessary. And the monies that could be spent on, or that are spent on them could be spent on other things. My first experience was 14 in Coolidge. I didn't know what was going on. I got out there. I almost got into an accident. I went back a couple times to see what I had done wrong. I went to the police department in Boston, and they shook their heads too, and they said there was no control that they had over us. This is not an expenditure I would make unless you're going to make a wholesale sh change throughout the state. You've got people in our own area who travel, who will be confused. You've got people from out of state. I don't see the point to it, but that's just a comment there. We need to work to coordinate time traffic lights within Southfield and neighboring communities on all roads. If the technology permits, invest in remote control central locations, which can instantly reset time lights for the entire metro region, or a good part of it. I know it's not perfect, but it should be able to be done in today's times. I was told it takes $4,000 to reset one traffic light. That's an absurdity to me. There are probably better ways to do that than what I was told. Increase the, significantly increase the number of speed limit signs. I made a sarcastic comment. I thought they were a vanishing breed. But <laughs> they are a traffic control. And unfortunately, they have been reduced supposedly due to costs over the years where you can go from 32 mile road in Romeo Plank to 26 mile and not see one. Mm. And on major roads like I-96, from here to almost the outlet center, I have data as to how many that I saw. It was pitiful. They are a control. They need to be reestablished within a reasonable uh, you know, formulation. I don't know what the laws federally and the state are. Uh, we have to have a stress education program on for, the, for drivers to maintain proper driving distances. If we want to cut down on 
multiple accidents, if we want to increase the visibility on the roads, if we want to make travel more pleasurable, this has to be done. When I'm up there at I-75 and I'm all over the area between Gaylord and the bridge, and I'm going down the road with my wife, and there are four cars on the road and three are bumper to bumper and say, what the heck are you up here for? I mean, what do you need to do that for? It's a habit that has become ingrained. It's a dangerous habit. I think we can change it. I presented some ideas on that. Whether they'll be taken up or not, it's up to the people who know a whole lot more than me. Immediately rescind the decision to allow trucks to drive in other than the right lane. I don't know who made that decision. It's one of the worst I've ever witnessed. Now, there are some rationales, I'm sure, but I think I can counter any rationale given to me. I can understand why it might have been done. That's all speculation. Truck drivers, like many drivers, abuse this decision and often drive in three lanes or four lanes on expressways and highways. They are also unnecessarily carrying over this option to the regular service roads. If you're out there, you can see what I'm saying. I'm not making it up. A car or a smaller vehicle traveling 70 miles an hour coming up on a truck doing 60 miles an hour, which is the way it's supposed to be, not that they all do it, what do you think's going to happen? They're veering left, they're veering right. I never would pass a truck on the right. I wanted to be a truck driver when I was back in college. I don't care anymore. I'm put into such positions today that you're going to get more erratic traffic and, and driving decisions made because of that. It's a bad decision. George, George, I'm, I'm not sure how many more you have, but... Okay. Very, very quickly. I won't go into the details on why I want that, uh, that uh, rescinded, but it should be obvious. Road construction, signage, and repairs. It's critical before, during, and after completion of road work to make sure they're accurate. If you go up to something and you expect what you're reading is going to be the way it is, it ought to be the way it is. It's getting better. It was so pitiful at one point. I figure, well, it's better go home and cool off. Uh, and we have to redevelop courtesy on the roads. It's contagious. It can go the right direction. It's gone the wrong direction. We're devouring each other out there. And I think we can change it. And all that's intended to fit in line with the road system because it all goes together. You can't separate these ideas out. You have to have a coordinated plan. Thank you. Sorry if I took too much of your time. Uh, we had a question here, and then I go back there. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, my question is, is this, you're going to see more and more of these things that are like in left field right now. We've got no light to show around. Like a sort of roundabout.
Times was in the mail uh, about the town hall and some of the concerns that uh, that were brought to me personally. <coughs> and I'll, I'll bring that one up because that's an interesting piece, and I think that uh, there can there's some room for improvement in terms of what is what does accountability actually look like, uh, you know, from all these projects that we do uh, around the state. So I, I'll go and see what we can come up with on that one. Also. Um, I don't know how much of it you do, but partnerships, collaborations, consortiums, all of those kinds of things are cost-saving measures. And the final item is, for those people who don't have access to a computer, uh, or transportation to the library, <laughs> uh, how do they access this information? I'll get to it. Um, can they write you? Yeah, yes, yeah. you guys can write. I'll give, I have business cards that I'll, I can pass on. You guys can write to Or you can always write your state representative. Right. Mm -hmm. Or you can write your state representative. And that leads me to... Uh, yeah, we, have, we, have, we, get, we can get you information. A lot of it's online. If you can't get a computer, we can get it to you, though. Okay. So that leads me to my closing uh, thoughts. So I always like to share with individuals and, and, and folks uh, when I go to community, if, whether it's a neighborhood association meeting or a PTA meeting, I always like to share. One, one of the things that... I'm most proud of as a state representative uh, is that my office does a tremendous job with what we call constituent services. Uh, not many people know uh, that you can call your state representative's office if you have a problem, you know, with uh, paying your mortgage, keeping your lights on. Uh, what are some other common things that we may get here uh, in terms of calls to our office? Dealing with an agency, whether it be MDOT or we don't want taxes. I always tell people, if you have a problem, start with your state representative. No matter what the problem is, we can always point you in the right direction. Uh, I used to work for uh, a congressman. His name is Sandy Levin. I used to do all his consent services. And this is one thing I used to always hate, right? So a person's having a problem with the IRS, okay? And so what do they do? They call an attorney and say, oh my God, I'm having a problem with the IRS, can you help me out? And I owe this much money, I need you to work it out with the IRS. That's what the attorney calls. They call the congressman's office and say, hey, there's a person in your district that's having a problem uh, with the IRS. You know, here's their information. I have the power of attorney. Uh, and they bill you for the hour, you know, that for the 15, 20 minutes they spoke with me on the telephone. And, and when I call the IRS, work it out, I call them back, and then they bill you again. And they give you the solution to pass it through. So, you can always start with your state representative. So, start with my office. I have, uh, I have a great, great, great staff. I've always had great staff. Uh, and they understand how important it is to me uh, that we answer every single call that comes into our office because that's what we're there for. And so uh, share that with your neighbors, share that with your family members. It does not matter what community you live in. That's what their state representative, that's what their state senator, their congressman, their U.S. senator is there for, is to help you out in any situation that you have. We're not, we just don't go up there and make policy and talk about politics and I hate Republicans and I hate Democrats. We're there for the people. And these, this is one of the services that we provide. And I'm very proud to say uh, that I provide very, very well. Okay? So I really appreciate you guys coming out and sharing your thoughts. Uh, I'll stay in touch with you by email. Please give me an email. We, we do excellent newsletters. Uh, so, is that in? You, you miss them? Well, we, we, I don't think we can send them out now because it was around the campaign time. And so we're kind of over restrictions about how much. <laughs> no, it's not always around campaign time. Well, now we're definitely around campaign time, so it's a restriction. Uh, but we'll be uh, picking back up very soon. Do you so, have any cars? Do I have any cars? Do I have any cars, Aaron? Uh, I have a few of mine and a few of yours. Aaron has, Aaron has cars in the back. Who's Aaron? Aaron is uh, my constituent okay. service director. Uh, he's the guy that, that will help out anyone that has a problem in the office. And Ted wasn't able to make it today. Ted's my policy guy. And I'm going to just give a quick shout out to Jeremy. Jeremy actually started with me uh, up in Lansing and was a, uh, what helped me organize the office and get it off the ground. And now he's on to bigger and better things.